Hello and welcome to the first podcast of 2019 from Le Monde Diplomatique. My name is George Miller, and this is an interview I recorded shortly before Christmas with Akram Belkaid, who is a member of Le Monde Diplomatique's editorial team in Paris. We spoke about Akram's article in the December edition of the paper, which examines the political situation in North Africa. Despite their differences, Algeria, Morocco and Tunisia all have leaders in poor health, who are increasingly remote from the people they nominally rule over. Algeria's octogenarian president Bouteflika had a stroke several years ago and has rarely been seen in public since. Yet apparently he intends to stand in this year's presidential election for a fifth time. Tunisia, the country where the Arab Spring began, also has presidential elections this year. President Esebsi is in his 90s, increasingly at loggerheads with his Prime Minister, but he too has expressed the intention to run again. And Morocco is ruled by Mohammed VI, a monarch who spends more and more time abroad seeking medical treatment, leaving a power vacuum behind when he does. So when we spoke, I began by suggesting to Akram that given the fragile health of those at the top, it's hard to work out who's really calling the shots in each of these countries. Yes, um, usually it was only the case for Algeria, because Algeria since the independence was not really having a kind of transparency. But for Tunisia and Morocco, the things were obvious. I mean, the king... The late King Hassan II was clearly, uh, if I may say, the boss. And in Tunisia, Bourguiba, the former president, and then after him, Ben Ali was also the boss. I mean, it was clear that they had the power. In Algeria, the questions were always who is really deciding uh, what are the relations inside uh, the army and so on. But you're right, today... What happens is that for the three countries, there are some questions and we don't have uh, answers because the situations are quite different, of course, but the powers are not clear. I mean, in Algeria, the situation is uh, really complicated. The president is absent, is is ill, and we don't know who is deciding and how things are decided. In Morocco, the king travels a lot, and obviously he is not interested by uh, managing his his country, although the fact that he has uh, the duty to do it, because Morocco is not a parliamentary monarchy, it's, uh, he, he has a kind of absolute power. And in Tunisia, because of the transition, because of the fact that the uh, nature of the regime is not clear because it's uh, at the middle point between a parliamentary uh, regime and a presidential regime. So you have the president and you have the prime minister and also you have a third power which is the Nahda party, the, the fundamentalist, the Islamist, which are having a lot of influence uh, and are playing uh, behind uh, the scene uh, political game. So uh, you're right. It's really difficult knowing that also uh, the press, the local press is uh, experiencing problems to, 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 to have the information and that and also that foreign uh, publications are not always able to report properly because of some difficulties on the, on the field. So if we zoom in on Algeria to start with, Akram, there we've got a president who's been in, in power since 1999, but he had a stroke several years ago and hasn't been seen to speak in public for several years. And yet there was an announcement that he was intending to stand in next year's presidential election. So who stands to benefit? Who, who is pulling the strings, do you think, in Algeria, if they've got an, in, an incapacitated man who, to all intents and purposes, really cannot exercise power? Who is the power behind the power? It's a very difficult question to answer. I mean, we just have hypotheses. Uh, first of all, we do think that his brother, Said Bouteflika, is having some ambitions to be a president. So he would 
try to use a fifth mandate to uh, strengthen his position because he, he doesn't belong to what we call in Algeria the revolutionary uh, family, uh, which has a kind of legitimacy from uh, the independence war. It's the case for uh, the, the, the actual president, but it's not the case for his brother. He's too young. He has not participated to the, to the independence war. So Bouteflika being in charge, or, I mean, officially, it helps his brother to strengthen his position, to conclude alliances with some uh, high rank officers like uh, generals or also he he's in uh, good relations with some uh, wealthy businessmen so during the third and the fourth mandates of uh, the the actual president uh, we saw that Said Bouteflika strengthened his his position but not enough to appear as an obvious candidate for the system so we can say that maybe a fifth mandate is a solution for a situation that has no solution. Let me explain it. In Algeria, uh, you have a system which is in charge since 1962. And at each crisis, uh, each political crisis, this system found the way to uh, pursue and to maintain the order by finding the man who could be supported by all the factions, by all the parts of the system. It happened when former President Boumedian died. Uh, suddenly we saw a guy, no one, I was, he was not well known, that was the President Chadley, and he was a kind of consensus uh, inside the, the, the system. Today, apparently, and clearly, that's what we can say, clearly there isn't a consensus uh, inside the system. The system is clearly divided. There is not an obvious candidate. There is not only one name that would appear and uh, convince all the others to accept the fact that he would be president. So, Bouteflika being a candidate again, it's a kind of uh, statu quo. Would it be naive to see the disbandment of the Intelligence and Security Department, which happened in, in 2016, as, as somehow being a reduction in the powers of, of the intelligence services in Algeria? Because they were replaced by a new department, which seemed to be more subservient to the president. But how do you, how do you read that particular change? Is that, is that really more a cosmetic change than a deep change? Well, I think that clearly Bouteflika and uh, his uh, faction gained some momentum versus the uh, intelligence uh, de uh, services. That is clear. I mean, uh, if you compare with the past, it, it was clearly his intention. I mean, when he was elected in 1999, he clearly said that he was not going to accept some interferences or uh, the uh, services telling him what he has to do and what he is not allowed to do. So it was a kind of really uh, a long-term strategy. And we can say that he he has been able to reduce the influence of uh, uh, these, uh, department, this department. But I'm not sure that this department has been defeated and that uh, its uh, influence has been uh, reduced to zero. I think that they are still in, uh, having some influence. I think that they are more powerful than we think. And it's just a question of a reorganization and uh, their uh, gaining from the situation because these services have been accused many times for the human rights violations. There is always the risk for this intelligence service to be accused by the international community. So uh, appearing uh, in a weak position, uh, in, a, in a, an apparent weak position, is uh, a kind of uh, benefit.
for, for, for mm-hmm. this service. Right. If we turn to Morocco, as you've said, King Mohammed VI is, is not a constitutional monarch. He's, he's an absolute monarch. And yet he's often absent. He's overseas. He's clearly not in good health. So is anyone making decisions in his absence or is the country in a kind of state of, of paralysis when he's not there? Well, the day-to-day business is managed by, his, uh, by the government and by uh, his councillors. Uh, but you're right, strategical decisions are not made. And Morocco is facing a huge number of challenges, among them the relations with Algeria, the tension at the border, the Sahara uh, problem, and also uh, social issues, uh, because uh, as the other Arab countries, Morocco uh, is facing unemployment and unrest. And uh, I mean, it has to be managed, and clearly it's not. So what we call the uh, Mahzen, which is all the system around the monarchy and which uh, supports the, the system, is really uh, anxious because this king clearly is not interested by managing his country as his father was doing. His father was clearly, you can criticize Hassan II because of the human rights violation, because of the lack of democracy, because of the fact that he he was really hard on his opponents. But one thing was clear that he was, I mean, handling the situation and uh, working every day. Clearly, it's not the case for his son. And this is why many people are there in Morocco are asking themselves, they do not know if he's really interested by remaining in place, by giving, uh, deciding to, to, to allow his son when it's going to be the time to be uh, the future king. There are some questions. And, uh, of course, this is not good for stability. His son is 15, so clearly he's not yet of an age to assume the throne. And meanwhile, Mohammed VI, when he is in the country, is concerned about his intelligence services and his army to make sure that they they don't, you know, flip sides. Of course, because history shows us that when you have this kind of situation, and especially in Morocco, it has happened in the past. I mean, in the 70s, his father was a target of at least two uh, attempts of uh, military coup. So he knows that he has to, whatever he, he is his feeling about uh, the uh, the job of uh, a king, he knows that he has to keep an eye really open on his uh, intelligence services, uh, the police, and uh, also the army, because the army used to be in the past a kind of problems for the monarchy. So this is why uh, he is regularly trying to change positions to assure that nothing dangerous would come from uh, these institutions. And does he, does he, broadly speaking, have popular support? Do most Moroccans in the streets still feel that, you know, that he, is the, he is the person they want to be leading their country? It's a very difficult question to, to answer because you have the official... Uh, um, speech and also the common uh, people they, they 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 well they they are regularly if you ask in in the street people about what do they think about the king it's very dangerous and difficult for them to answer with a kind of sincerity because you can be jailed if you criticize too strongly the the, the king and uh, but to to, to talk frankly, I don't see a, a lot of, I mean, uh, anxious feelings. Uh, sometimes people are not at all, uh, they're used to it. I mean, they're used to it. They're used to it. The, the king is popular because sometimes he, he, he has some initiatives that provides him uh, some a kind of uh, support. He, everybody knows that he, he, he drives he, his car alone, that sometimes he he can suddenly appear in a public area and uh, shaking hands and speaking with people. And so this is, it gives him some kind of support, but the middle class is more, the upper middle class is, is more concerned by, by what is happening, but it doesn't lead 
it to criticize the monarchy and to dream about a revolution that would lead to a republic. The idea of monarchy is still strong in Morocco, clearly. Right. And if we turn Akram lastly to Tunisia, which famously was the country where the, the Arab Spring first began. Yes. There we have a 92 year old president um, in charge and has announced that he intends to stand in the presidential elections in December 2019. But interestingly, you say that a lot of Tunisians are beginning to think that the parliamentary elections are actually going to be more important for how power is handled in the country. Can you say something a little bit about the, that tension between president and, and parliament and prime minister? Clearly, the, the president, Beji Qaid Sibsi, has uh, not understood that there is uh, a new republic in Tunisia and that the president hasn't the same power that it used to be in the past, that he isn't able to behave as Bourguiba did in the past. And this is clearly due to the constitution. So we have two heads today in Tunisia, clearly. You have the uh, president, which has his word to say, which can um, propose laws, which can uh, give uh, orientations, which has the right to conduct the foreign policy. But the final decision is done with the parliament. And uh, in the parliament, if you are not close to your government, and if the, this government is closer than you, than the president to the parliament, it creates a kind of uh, competition. And it is the case today in Tunisia, where clearly the prime minister decides alone. And uh, if I may say, he doesn't care if the president agrees or not. And we saw that when the prime minister decided to conduct uh, a change in his uh, in the governmental team uh, last September in uh, in October, uh, the, the the president heard it apparently, and he said that heard it by, on, on TV, learned it on TV. I mean, he was not at all in the process, and he could do nothing. So. In a country where people used to think that the president was the main position, they are, uh, the Tunisians are uh, experiencing the fact that their system might be more complicated than they thought and that the uh, parliamentary elections are maybe more important than the presidential election. Uh, this is also important if you go to analyze the um, strategy of Nada, uh, the Islamist uh, party, which is not ready to present an, uh, a candidate for uh, the presidential election because it, they are afraid to uh, face uh, the same situation that has happened in Egypt in 2013, where uh, a fundamentalist, where uh, President Morsi just lasted one year, uh, and then he had to um, face a coup from, from the army. The fundamentalists in Tunisia, they do know that uh, it's better not for them to have the control of the presidency that would create maybe some kind of problems uh, also with the Europe, but they can grant themselves more influence by focusing on uh, the parliamentary elections. And this is what is happening right now in Tunisia. So that clearly is an event to watch closely next year. I wondered, Akram, just to finish, yes. are there other particular moments or particular places or particular people that you'll be watching really closely in 2019 as a sort of signal of, of perhaps what lies ahead for this region? Well, in Algeria, we are still waiting the official announcement of uh, Mr. Bouteflika's uh, candidature. I mean, uh, we are still waiting for that. Uh, officially, uh, there are some, we have some affirmations that uh, he, he might not go because he's unable to go. As you said in the beginning, uh, he hasn't been able to uh, to speak 
in public since uh, 2014, which is uh, really mm, uh, a long time. A long time. Uh, so we'll follow that, and in, uh, and uh, we have also to follow the discussions that are taking place between Algeria and Morocco. Clearly, these two countries are looking for uh, a kind of uh, uh, peaceful agreement to lower uh, the tensions between the, 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 the two countries, and it's something really important. I was talking to Akram Balkaid about his article Maghreb Rulers Cling On, which is in the December 2018 edition of Le Monde Diplomatique. It's available in the print edition and on the website at mondediplo.com. If you're a subscriber, you can read the current issue online and access a complete archive of the paper going back over 20 years, as well as exploring other resources such as maps, images, the podcast archive and online exclusive content. And if you're not yet a subscriber, there's plenty of free content online to entice you to become one, and full details on how to go about it. In the words of the late John Berger, why read LMD? To make sense of what's happening in the world, behind the misinformation. I hope you'll join me again soon for another interview with one of our contributors. Until then, thank you very much for listening, and goodbye.